Hi. About six months ago, I went online to post pictures of this laser table with a couple of pretty innovative laser modules to support multiple diodes in a cool housing that I had built to support 5.6 millimeter diameter LOC 815 and now LOC 826 red modules that work at about 857 nanometers at room temperature. And at the same time that I built this module, I decided, well, what the heck, why not build a second module, not that much harder, to support the blue or the 445 Casio-based module of diodes. It would allow me to run two colors and not have to do a lot of re-engineering. So I built two modules, one red, one blue, with dual knife edges to allow me to both um, compress in the X and the Y direction, as you can see, and as I posted earlier. Since that time, I've made some changes because there are some advantages and disadvantages to this design, and I've incorporated this all into a projector, and I'll show you some of the innovations, some of the ideas I've come up with, some of the problems I've had. Uh, the cooled module uh, has a few advantages, uh, especially for the 815 uh, diodes, in that cooling them to minus 20, minus 30 degrees centigrade really increases their visibility. They're two to three times sharper at, excuse me, brighter at the 645 nanometers that they operate at, at about minus 20 degrees centigrade. And so it's worth the extra effort and the extra inconvenience of having the cooling module. It turns out that with the blue diodes, the 445, there really aren't any advantages. Uh, the color doesn't shift. It hardly shifts at all, maybe one nanometer with cooling. And if anything, in the wrong direction, it goes to the blue. In addition, there are alignment issues and compromises that you have to make when you isolate the diodes that are particularly problem, uh, problematic when you're doing the alignment of the blues. Specifically, uh, the red module, because of the requirement for cooling, you can see that the window has to be heated to prevent condensation, and the diodes are set back about 20 millimeters from the surface of the glass in order to prevent them from uh, conducting a, a lot of heat, or, or a lot of cold, I should say, heat being conducted from the window to the uh, module that's holding the diodes. Short answer, or short uh, explanation, is that that distance uh, provides um, a challenge for alignment, because it means that the diode being farther from the first knife edge means that any misalignment in the setup of the diodes can create a challenge when you're trying to produce a very straight line from the first stage of knife edges. Any um, lack of perfectly parallel lines uh, in the diodes when they come into the second knife edge, as you can see probably better in the second set, uh, prevents you from compressing as effectively as you might want to at the second stage. And so as a result, this has to be as perfect as possible, and the distance makes it difficult to be perfect. Secondly, the mirrors, as you can see, in the 2D arrangement uh, require that I could not have the ability to shift the mirrors as well as to um, tip and tilt them in the XY direction. And so when the mirror is being knife edged to the diode, I have to make a best guess estimate when I'm gluing the mirrors onto the posts. And then after a complete setup and a complete alignment, I then look and see if any of the diodes don't hit the mirrors at an optimal position near the edge to give me a, an optimal compression. I then have to take that peg out, put it in a special jig, measure the position of the mirror, remove the mirror, re-glue it, and put the peg back in with the new mirror and realign it. It's a hassle, and with 20 diodes, it really was very time consuming. The good side, the good fact is that once you do it, even if you put a new diode in when they burn out, uh, it doesn't change the alignment enough to ever have to re-glue them. You glue them once and they're, and they're fine. The blues, however, because of the very thin stripe and the necessity to try to produce as compressed a uh, package as possible to allow you to do some post-stacking uh, uh, lens work or prism work to get the best beam quality, means that you have to try to, uh, try to knife edge these diodes even more uh, carefully so that you don't produce uh, wasted space between the diodes. Consequently, it was, it was more than a challenge. It was, it was producing not such a good beam quality. I could not pack them very well, and as a result, I was not able to do any kind of post-compression 
modulation on the blue diodes. So without an advantage from the thermal effect and with the disadvantage of the fixed mirrors and the distance between the mirrors and the diodes, I finally gave up on using this cooled housing for the blue diodes. It just didn't make sense. So what I did is I moved to a more conventional setup for the blue diodes and we're using uh, Dave's flex mounts, um, the um, flex mirror uh, supports with the flexure mounting instead of the spring mounting that I used on the uh, other modules. Uh, set up a 2D instead of a 3D setup. Uh, and consequently, I was able to produce a very nice knife edging. You can see that the stripes are right near the edge of each of the uh, primary reflectors. And it's very easy to work with this setup. Now I know why everybody does it this way. It's, it's easy and it works well. Uh, as you can see, the first row of six uh, go through a wave plate from Tower Optical. Pricey, but uh, super high quality. There's almost no visible reflection from the surface uh, when it's operating. All right, I just turned everything to standby and hopefully this won't wash out the camera and you'll be able to see a little bit better uh, the setup for the uh, blue knife edges as well as the setup of the mounts. Um, typical 2D array, uh, the poles are set about one millimeter back on each subsequent mirror to allow them to knife edge without having to move very far back on the uh, adjustable screw that holds them in position. And uh, the entire plate is approximately 200 millimeters by 300 millimeters and is approximately 20 millimeters thick. Because there was no advantage to um, cool, chilling these things beyond room temperature or essentially no more than 5% even when you brought them down to minus 20, I like to simply to keep them at ambient and so therefore I water cool the whole plate. And the way that's done is simply a ball mill uh, drills two troughs uh, hemispherical, hemicylindrical troughs, and then a um, aluminum tube is press, pressed in there and held by a bottom plate, which is just held together by a couple of uh, screws that are deep set into the top plate. It's very convenient, it produces very good cooling control, and allows me to simply piggyback off the water system that is cooling the other modules. So this was not hard and works very effectively. The um, Optics, as I was going through before, uh, Tower Optical, very nice, very expensive. Uh, JML, uh, very nice, not too expensive. Uh, about 98% average transmittance when you add reflection and transmission through this uh, polarizing beam splitter tube. Um, the combined output moves through two Edmund anamorphic prisms that are set up uh, to produce about a 1.8 magnification here. The only innovative thing that I did here is uh, the standoff for the prisms is set to be uh, exactly the same dimension as the prism itself. But what I did is I took up a little bit of additional thickness by taking a post-it note and graphing on all the pertinent angles that would be necessary for the alignment of these prisms, pasted that down, and then using, using that paper both as a protection for the glass in case my clumsy fingers knock them over, as well as uh, allowing me to set up the angles without having to do too much experimentation, it worked very well. And they're locked down, they won't move, and they're um, held very squarely so there's no tipping or tilting because the uh, clearances are very small. The uh, final beam comes out of here, is angled down to bring it to the right height, the original height of about uh, 35 millimeters above the surface. And then the uh, output, the expanded output, passes through a uh, die core. This one is a uh, pass blue, pass red, reflect green. It comes from one stop optical shot and is pretty good. It reflects about 95% of the incident 532 and transmits about 95, 96% of the uh, blue. And um, I like this filter. It comes in a square, it's their higher grade filter and it works very well. The, com oh, the secondary filter that combines the five, 645 nanometer light with the two blue and green beams, I'm not happy with this. Uh, this filter reflects about 15% of the blue, combined blue output. Um, the P-polarization is about 80% uh, transmission and the um, S-polarization is about 92% uh, transmission. 
and the green averages at about 85% uh, transmission. However, I've looked at about three or four different suppliers uh, for these filters, Semra, uh, Lambda Research, uh, Edmund, nobody makes anything better. So even though I'm not really happy with these, I haven't found a better alternative. But a lot of power to spare, and so after the combination, everything is sent over to these EMS 4000 scanners. I really like these scanners. Uh, they come in with a whole variety of mirror uh, sizes available. I ordered the largest simply because the size of my red beams and also my blue beam are so large they fill up the mirrors. And if I could get bigger mirrors, I would use even bigger mirrors. But uh, there are compromises that obviously you know about. And one of the problems I had even so was that with even these large 14 by 20 millimeter mirrors, I still could not pack all of the 20 of the original red diodes onto there without some compression optics and therefore uh, far field uh, beam quality uh, degradation. So I experimented around with some non-orthogonal angles on these uh, mirrors. And the point is, if you take the initial mirror and instead of it hitting everything at a 45 degree, you tip it so that it's more at about a 22 degree angle, you increase the available aperture by about two millimeters. Consequently, you have to move the Y or the secondary mirror in because the angle of incidence is no longer orthogonal but at an angle. And so you have to move it in a little bit to capture the beam. But again, because of the long lengths of these mirrors, it does capture the beam and I can enhance the aperture, the usable aperture, a fair amount. The downside is it produces a distortion because of the non-orthogonal arrangement in the final projected image. And if it wasn't for Pangolin's geometric uh, correction, I would have to forego this and I'd have to go back to the lenses. But they have a really neat feature, if everybody isn't familiar with it, it's worth looking at, that allows you to correct uh, pin cushion, keystone, shear, rotation. And so I can take out the distortion that, are produced, that is produced by these uh, mirrors and produce a very nice uh, down, downfield picture. Um, The only other sort of uh, thing that I would add to this, things that I've, uh, I've sort of learned in the process, is that uh, as it stands, the original 20 diode modules have now gone to 16, because as I said before, I can't get all 20 in, in a, uh, onto these scanners without using compression lenses, so it wasn't worth it. So I went down to a 4x4 array, and with careful stacking, I can fit them onto the mirrors. Because I had freed up the second module, and I had essentially the same design, I decided, why not? And I ended up producing a second red module, which is then combined in another JML beam splitter tube. The total output of the red is now 9 watts at 645, and it really does swamp the 1.5 watt Vashio uh, 532. It's pretty much as bright, nearly as bright, as the 12 um, 445 diodes, and I'll show you some pictures that kind of demonstrate that, but I've got more than enough red. So let me see if I can show you some images and we'll show you how, how this thing has progressed. Just before I go to the computer to show you the pictures, I probably should trace through the beam path because in addition to the scanners, there's a little bit of a novelty to the way that I'm sending the beam out. The beam that comes out of the scanners ang angles down at about a 45 degree angle and I pick it up with the secondary mirror, which then sends it to a tertiary mirror overhead. And the reason for this um, was primarily for our small parties. I wanted to get everything above everybody's head and I clearly can't move this 500 pound projector. So a second surface mirror, uh, it's about one and a half by one meter is set at about 50 degrees and takes the image that expands off of the scanner and sends it about 12 meters across to the other side of the room. Uh, we've used up only the center portion, but it, uh, the screen right there is about, oh, 20 feet by about 25 feet. Forgive my mixing the English and the metric here. Uh, and is made out of an agricultural uh, material used for hydroponic farming. And it's got a really nice uh, scrim material that gives it some strength and a nice reflectivity and a fairly neutral color. It's, uh, it's a good, useful material and hangs very, very straight. So you don't see the tape job whenever all the lights are off. And we have done a little bit of um, damage to it moving in and out to, to, to work with the screen. But you can see how the thing is set up right now. 
we've pretty much filled the entire screen with uh, light, and you'll see that when I turn off the light. But again, it gives you a scale of things and how we've set this up for uh, our demonstration. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the settings uh, page, over to the projection zones, and over to the geometric correction to show you what the tool is that I'm using to correct the uh, distortion caused by the uh, scanner setup. I'll produce uh, a grid pattern. You'll see that this here is actually the inverse of what you what is being done to the uh, to the scanned output. So the scanned output looks sort of like the mirror of this when it comes raw out of the scanner. By applying this correction, I can produce a pretty good square, uh, well-aligned pattern up on the screen. Now, as you can see, that pattern. I don't know if the camera uh, captures it real well in this light level. But this pattern has a little bit of shear in it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to manipulate it to kind of correct the shear so I can square it up. I'm adding more shear right now. And as you can see, it's getting worse and worse. I can then get rid of the shear and produce a pretty nice square image. So anyway, that's the feature that I discovered and I've had a lot of fun with in correcting the, um, the output of the scanners. It's supposedly made for projecting onto non-flat surfaces. If you're going to do a projection onto a, a ball or a sphere or a curved building, you can correct the images so they don't produce uh, elongated or distorted images. And obviously you can see size, position, rotation, linearity, pin cushion, bow shear. There's a lot of features and it's a lot of fun to play with that. I'm going to go back from here though and I'm going to show you an example of some uh, lines that give you an idea of the fineness of the lines, the alignment of the colors, uh, the relative brightness. The green is at full power, and uh, the red and the blue are both at 80% settings simply because they just overwhelm the green. The alignment of the different colors is pretty good, and uh, this image here shows you sort of what the red and the blue look like when combined. There's essentially no green output in there. And then in this, you can see that the alignment of the green and the red are pretty good. Beam size and alignment are pretty good. You can see a lot of overspeed. Uh, the brightness is pretty incredible. I mean, you know, you get a seizure in here uh, if, you're, if you're not careful. And like I said, they're not even up at full power. The blues are operating at one milliamp, or uh, excuse me, one amp uh, to the FlexMod G3 drivers. And um, the reds, are all operating at 350 milliamps for the drivers. So they're not being driven very hard, and I'm only running them at 80% of those levels, and still plenty, plenty bright. Um, the final one that I'm showing here shows a, a good picture of the white, the green, the blue, the mixture. I'm very pleased with the output. Uh, there's really nothing that I would do to change um, the setup as it is right now is great for our parties, and despite the losses of the mirror above, it does give you a lot of control uh, so that you can miss people and still not have to move the projector. I think uh, in the future, if you were if anyone's in building something like this, I think probably uh, the changes that I would suggest are that one of these red modules is probably plenty bright uh, for anyone's uh, use in a projector. And if you went down to, say, 12 diodes, I don't think you would need to have both wings of the module. Can you see me at this light level? Yep. Okay. Um, both sides are being cooled, each side with 200 watts of uh, Peltier cooling to the water cooler. I don't think you would need that. I'm not even sure that I need to drive it that hard myself. Uh, I sort of overbuilt it so that I wouldn't necessarily have to redo it. But I think you could get away with one side cooling and clearly a smaller box. The offset from the table, the height of these modules, is also unnecessarily high. I had built them this way to use stainless steel standoffs because the low thermal conductivity of stainless steel might allow these to be better insulated. Not necessary. The hard fiber washers and plastic connections that are underneath here are so good that the stainless steel isn't even cool to the touch right below the module, so you don't need this much standoff. You could reduce the size of these a lot. Um, in addition, uh, I think probably to compress this, a um, setup that didn't require you putting the electronics and everything on the table could make this a lot more compact. And I do think I would stick with the idea of using the non-orthogonal uh, mirrors. I think it's a nice setup, and I would definitely do that if I did another projector. And I probably will. 
Thank you very much.